everybody, this is the Wild Ass Podcast, and I am your host, Wild Ass Craig. This is episode six, and in this episode, I get to introduce all of you to Joe Byron. Joe is a guy that I've gotten to know and become friends with over the years through the Arizona Bike Week event, where we work with Joe and his crew at Harley-Davidson of Scottsdale. Here's a little background about Joe. He first started working for Auburn Harley-Davidson as a counter guy in the parts department of the dealership in August of 2001 in Auburn, California. Joe worked there for about two years before moving to Rockland Harley-Davidson, a bigger dealership with more opportunity for growth in Rockland, California, where he actually took a step backward in hopes of moving forward. He worked in the collision center as a parts guy at that dealership. Within six months, Joe was promoted to parts manager at a sister store in Folsom, California just a couple mile crow flight from the prison made famous by Johnny Cash. Folsom Harley-Davidson is where he spent the bulk of his career until he decided to move to Arizona in 2015 when he was hired as the parts manager at Chester's Harley-Davidson in Mesa. Just three months of employment there and the dealership was sold, becoming Desert Wind Harley-Davidson. And in 2017, the parts manager position at Harley-Davidson of Scottsdale opened up and Joe made his move to work at the world's largest Harley-Davidson dealership. Joe claims this move to be his best decision ever, and since taking the position, he's made his way up the ranks. So far up the ranks that in March of 2021, he was promoted to the general sales manager. Just yesterday, the day before recording this podcast, Joe was given the news that as of March 1, 2022, he will now be the new GM at Harley-Davidson of Scottsdale. On that note, I would like to take this opportunity to say congratulations, Joe Byron, and welcome to the show. Hey, Craig. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's it's. I'm looking forward to this one because I didn't realize we may have a little more in common than I thought, looking at your timeline here. Um, okay. <laughs> and it's funny, you started in Auburn, California, which I actually have a relative that lives there, my uncle. and. Oh, wow. uh I, I'm like, oh, I got this typed in. I'm like, I'm going to give him a call, see how things are going. So it was a great excuse to reconnect <laughs> with him. Right. He was telling me that dealership has been closed for a while. Yeah, I think in 2000, I want to say 2008 or 2009 when the economy kind of turned, uh, they they weren't going to be able to make it through that, and they shut their doors. They were a bit of a smaller dealership. So they actually turned it over to the old owners when it was C&E Harley-Davidson um, back for – uh, it was Auburn, and those owners bought it, and they turned it into, I think, an Indian dealership. Okay. Is it still there? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I haven't been home back home for a while, but I'm pretty sure that's still up and running. Cool. You left there. I'm just I'm just going to go through these notes quick, because you left there, and you mentioned you might be taking a step backwards, but you were uh, in the collision center, which makes total sense to me. I didn't even know this was a thing. It's not necessarily for all all dealerships. Like honestly, that was the only dealership that I've worked for that had a separate collision center. But they had an offsite warehouse where they ran all their collision work through. And at that time, that position was available. And essentially, I mean, I was running that parts area because, of course, I was the one only one there. And then the, our dealership itself was maybe two miles away, so we, it was really easy to run parts back and forth and. And so they just had it as a separate entity. So it was interesting. I mean, it worked well. It was only a few of us that worked there. And you know, obviously, I, I did a good enough job to uh, catch their attention. That's that's awesome. So the uh, the Collision Center, I imagine you got to see a lot of stuff in there that was interesting. Oh, yeah. I mean, and then not only that, but you get buried and take off parts for sure. But, yeah, you see, you definitely see the gamut of stuff coming through there from the mildest to the, uh, to the wow, I hope he's okay. Yeah, definitely. The stuff we don't want to see as bikers, right? For sure. Absolutely. On your notes here, it says 2017 is when you made the move up to Scottsdale. Do you remember when in 2017? Was it early? Uh, it, yeah, it was uh, March. So it was actually right before we were going to have the Bike Week, obviously. And that was kind of my introduction, really, to Bike Week here on the working side of it. Uh, because I had always been on the, you know, outside looking in and kind of just playing, not actually having to work it. So, yeah, so I, I stepped in this building, and, and since we're such a big part of Bike Week, it kind of really opened my eyes. First thing I walked into when they were giving me my tour was a basement full of pallets with Phantom Hines exhaust stacked up on it. And I'm just like, holy crap, I don't think I've seen that, many, that much exhaust in one place all at once before. <laughs> I bet. 
anytime you see these places prepare for these events, it's it's amazing. What struck it's, me as it's definitely an undertaking. Yeah. What struck me as odd is twenty seventeen. I think that's the first year that we came out. Is that does that sound right? Were we there out on the lot the first year that you were there? I were you guys out here in two thousand seventeen? I couldn't remember if it was two thousand. Yeah, it would have to been because we did it for a couple of years. We've done it for a few years together now. So, yeah, two thousand seventeen would be the first year. Yeah, we were. I think we were set up actually on the sidewalk, kind of outside. At the time, right. it was a rental door, right where you, they did yep. rental bikes. It's all coming back to me. Yeah, exactly. We had you right there on the on the porch and uh, kind of separate from uh, the rest. Um, and then you know, kind of your position or how we've done things has kind of evolved from there and we've actually created more of a vendor row since then but yeah no, that was the first year out with our uh, working together yeah that's crazy because i was trying to think of that I'm, I'm going back in time in my brain as i read this i'm like 2017 that has to be the year brian put us together brian clock put you and i together and uh we actually jumped in with him i did jumped in yep. with him and his crew and drove out and yeah, set up. I think they were next to us on the sidewalk, and then yeah, that's right. We had you guys right next to each other, and yeah, that was really kind of our flagship year of kind of doing stuff here at the dealership as well as out at Westworld for Bike Week, and kind of you know filling things out and seeing how things went. Um, you know, obviously it worked well because we continue to have you guys out here. Yeah, and, and we, I love coming out there every year. I've driven out to Mitchell, throw my stuff in their trailer. And then we drive out together. Typically, it's funny. I end up driving Brian's truck more than his employees do because I just like to drive and get going. And uh, that's worked out really well. It'll be a little different this year. We're coming out by ourselves, So we can talk about the evolution of Arizona Bike Week uh, right. shortly. But uh, it, was, it was just interesting to me to find out that I was there the same year that you were there the first time. Because in a previous episode, I talked with the store manager for... JNP Cycles, where we head down to Daytona, and our first mm-hmm. bike week there was his first bike week as well. Oh wow! Yeah, very cool. Yeah, we're all growing up together. Look at us go. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so, going back a little bit, you know, you started work in two thousand one. How did you get into motorcycles? What was your first bike? Uh, Do you remember the chain of bikes that got you where you are now? Kind of tell us a little bit about your history. Sure. Well, really, it was from my dad. Uh, my dad has always been into motorcycles growing up, and you know he actually had uh, built some from the ground up. He was in a he was in hot bike high, uh, hot bike magazine, um, which I'm not even sure if that bike is still uh, that uh, magazine still around. But yeah, he had sure. uh, he had made one of his builds, made it into that magazine. Um, I remember clearly, you know, his evenings being spent in the garage working on this thing, and you know, piece by piece, and it, it always intrigued me. I hadn't had my own motorcycle up to that point. I'd always kind of like. I guess as a child, just watched him and envy as he got to ride his. And he actually worked for Auburn Harley Davidson. He was their service manager and he started working for them, I believe in 99. And at that time I was working at uh, a lake and I was running their Marina. Um, and I had done that since I was 13 years old and kind of worked, worked there till I was 21, you know, summers as I was younger. And then of course, full time when I got older and between that and going to college. So I was like, you know, I was like, ah, I don't know if, you know, where the marina life is going to take me, if anywhere in life. And my dad let me know that the parts position had come available at Auburn Harley. And I was like, you know what, I, I've always been around it. I, I'd love to be part of that again. And, and uh, you know, I had an idea of uh, parts, breakdowns, and all that stuff work because obviously in the marine world, you're working on outboards and all those parts explosions are all very, very similar in that sense. So that wasn't too much of a stretch for me. It was just kind of learning the, the brand and the premise for myself. and. You know, I picked up, uh, picked it up very easily um, and uh, kind of it took off from there. And, you know, it's, it's crazy to think about it. That's been, you know, coming up on 21 years of doing this. It doesn't seem like it's been that long, but yeah, I've been doing this for a while now. Time flies, doesn't it? Sure does. What uh, What was your first bike? Do you remember? Were you a dirt biker as so a my kid? My first bike or? was actually, no, I mean, I my parents, we always had like ATCs and my, uh, growing up. Um, you know, most people I think listening will probably know what an ATC is, but, um, deemed too dangerous for everybody nowadays. But I remember taking that as a kid, taking it in my, the line of line of trucks to be lined up in a row. And I, my dad would let me at least just ride them around the, the right, the right of trucks, uh, the row of trucks. And that was always fun. And, but my actual first bike that I owned myself was actually a 2002, uh, Buell Cyclone. 
um, that was my first purchase, and that was my uh, really my first intro into uh, street riding. Well, you don't see those on the road at all anymore, do you? You don't, but you know what's funny is uh, one of our service riders here, he actually has one down in the basement. And, uh, he's, it's kind of like a work in progress. He's kind of, you know, tweaks on it here and there. Um, you know, obviously parts are a little harder to find for those nowadays, but it's my exact bike. And I walk by, I go, damn, it takes me back. I miss that bike. But, uh, I had sold that bike just because I wanted to pay off some bills so that I could buy a house. So, you know, it did the whole adulting thing and uh, got rid of that, which was hard to do. And then, uh, we bought our first house and then, then I didn't have a bike for a while after that, actually probably for about four years. The nice thing about working at a dealership, though, is and especially having a rentals department, is when those rentals need to be broke in. I can, I was always able to scratch that itch and take that bike out and go break it in for you know a few days. So that was always nice to have. That kind of you know saved me from making payments for a while. Yeah, for sure. After that, I think my next bike was my uh, my Fat Boy, and that was when I was working at Folsom Harley Davidson. We took one in on trade, and it was a at that time I think it was 2011 when I was there the year that I bought it and it was a 2002 fat boy and it only had 3,600 miles on it. And the guy who bought it put all the money into it, like front to back paint, Chrome. I mean the whole works and it was a gorgeous bike and they took it in for fairly cheap. And uh, so I jumped all over that. And uh, one of those things where I just took it home and parked it in the garage and said, Hey, look what I bought, you know, to the wife at the time. She's like, you did? I go, yeah. She's like, oh, okay. And I hadn't, but uh, I tested the water. Like, okay, well, I guess tomorrow I'm signing the paperwork. Nice. So, yeah. So I that I uh, got that bike. That was my bike for, for quite a while. And I had it all the way into Arizona. And in fact, I got rid of it in 2019. So I had that bike for a while. That's crazy. And then, uh, yeah. And that was fun because that one, I, um, I was in a bit of a, a small fender bender, but it did enough damage to where I was, uh, a lot of the bike had to come apart, so I took advantage of that and I had to repaint it. I had everything blacked out. So basically, I redid that bike front to back, and I actually kind of bring it full circle with my dad. I got that into uh, Thunder Roads uh, magazine after I had redone it all, and they kind of did a little quick bio on me and, and put the picture of the bike in there and, and did, some, did a photo shoot at the shop in Folsom. So that was pretty cool. So uh, my dad got his in a, in a magazine. I got mine in the magazine, so that was that was fun. I didn't know that either. That's really cool. Yeah, Thunder Roads is out of, are they out of the Northeast or are they out of the, are they out by you? So I know that there's like, I think the way that that magazine works is it's, it's kind of like regional or district style. Like, like the Northern California had its one and Southern California had its one. And, you know, they had their publishers for the different areas. I don't know how far it stretched nation, nation wise, but um, I know that was uh, a West Coast wise. There was some uh, publications out there. Okay. Yeah. I heard them on a podcast and I can't remember which one, but it was, it was interesting to listen to because I got to, they talked about how that magazine came from literally nothing to right. what it is now, which it's a cool story. Yeah. 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 So that was, that was cool. But, uh, I love that bike. That was a fun bike. I mean, I had it for a long time. And then, um, my last bike, which is, I, um, haven't had a different one since was my 2019, uh, roguelite special. And as I do, I, bought it and then stuck it in the service department and said, Hey, here's all the stuff I want to do to it. You know, <laughs> and, uh, I can't, I can't ever leave anything alone. That's been my curse of everything I buy, whether it's my vehicles, uh, truck wise or, or motorcycles, they, they do not get left in stock. So, uh, that one got to the shop right away and, you know, handlebars, motor work, uh, of course did a little, uh, a little paint work on it to just to differentiate it from everything else out there. So I'm wondering if I've seen that bike because I, what, I, I have in my notes here, that leads us up to what you're riding now. Was it in 2018 that you had gotten into a wreck? So was no, it? it was actually, it was 2019. Okay, it was. And at, at, and of all times, it was on my way to work for the first day of bike week. Yeah, I remember, uh, yeah, okay. I knew we had known each other, and I couldn't remember if it was 2018 or 19. And uh, I remember it was like opening day, we're on the yep. lot, and we're like, where's Joe? And then we found out. So if you don't mind, I mean, this is, this is the side of the industry that we hate to see as riders. Sure. Talk us through that. What, tell the story of what happened and kind of what's gone on since then. I know you and I have communicated a few times, making sure everything's good and you're walking and, and uh, it's definitely been a a long road. (laughs) It was a long road for sure. I was, uh, 
Um, but yeah, it was uh, April, I think, well, I'm in my head, it was April 3rd of 2019. And uh, it was the first day of bike week, so it was Wednesday. Got up early that morning, obviously, to get up here to get everybody situated. And, you know, it's one of those things that you look back and you're like, okay, if I would have made this decision, would, would this not have happened? Part of the reason I got up early is I wanted to get a haircut and, and be fresh for bike week. So on my way to work, I'm, I'm driving and, you know, Arizona is notorious for traffic. I mean, we're uh, very, um, you know, a lot of people live in the city. And, and so it's just the roads are congested in that commute time. So I was on my way to work and it was normal, slow traffic and, you know, bumper to bumper. And I'm kind of trying to make my way through. And I was like, oh, you know what? Here's my exit. This exit, I go with my, my barber. Uh, so I started making my way over and I was dealing with a guy in front of me that wasn't like wanting to play nice. He didn't give a shit really about bikers. But uh, I'm trying to make my way over and he's kind of brake checking me. And, you know, we're going at a good clip, probably 30 miles an hour at that time. And I'm trying to get my way over. And I looked over my right shoulder and to make sure that it's clear for me to get over. And I looked back and he had brake checked me again, but a little harder this time. And I was coming right for him. I braked as hard as I could and threw my bike to the, to the right to try to avoid him. But my left side clipped him. And, uh, and really at that point, I remember, you know, saying, oh shit, cause I knew I was going to hit him. And I didn't know to what extent it was going to be, but, uh, you know, next thing I remember is waking up, looking at the paramedics above me. And, uh, you know, that lasted for probably like 30 seconds. It was, it was almost like, you know, those war scenes in movies where it's like the, you know, shell shock and things are kind of weird and muffled. And, and it was like that. I was like, wow, that's pretty much true to life. And, uh, then it kind of just, uh, remember lifting my leg up and seeing it move in a direction it wasn't supposed to move. And, and then, uh, I went passed right back out and, uh, actually woke up in the hospital and, uh, I woke up into the hospital to my mother crying, which is never something you want to hear. And I was kind of like, oh, shit, this could uh, I think this is more serious than I even realized, uh, obviously, because uh, I didn't know to what point I was. And I, I definitely definitely was doped up because I was, uh, um, you know, talking to my parents or whatever. And I was making jokes. And, and my dad's like my dad even told me he's like at that point, he's like, I knew you were fine. He's like, you're still making jokes. He's like, we showed you your face. Your face was all swollen with, you know, two black eyes. Because I was wearing, at that point, I'd only been wearing a, a half helmet. I normally ride with a three-quarter helmet or a full face. That morning, I decided not to. You know, it's like all these little decisions that you make, right, that are not normal to you, what you do. Like, okay, things would have been so different. Um, but, yeah, uh, I was, you know, I was yelling out. I'm like, yo, Adrian, to the nurses and stuff. So my head's like, yeah, he's fine. And he's all there mentally. He's good. He's going to have to heal up otherwise. So, but it was, uh, it was still pretty serious. I mean, I had, uh, I had a laundry list of, of, uh, of injuries. You know, I had some internal bleeding that had to be fixed. I had a, um, lacerated spleen and kidney. And then I had, you know, my leg was a double compound fracture, uh, break. Um, so I was dealing with that. I had a couple broken teeth, uh, skull fractures. So it was a pretty long laundry list. And I was in ICU for, uh, what was that? Three or four days before they released me back to just the regular, uh, regular room. So yeah, it was a long road. Um, oh, you know, crazy. I figured, yeah, I figured by the time I was done with that and when I get released from the hospital, you know, that that was going to be, you know, the beginning, at least of the end of my, uh, concerns. But, you know, as I healed and, uh, started going through uh, physical therapy, my leg just wasn't, wasn't doing what it needed to do. I had, uh, my bone wasn't, uh, wasn't making contact and kind of healing. So the, the orthopedic was like, look, we got to go back in and we got to try something different to get this thing to heal. So probably four months down the road, I was right back in the, right back in the ER getting another surgery done on my leg. And when they did that one, then two months later, I had a couple screws back out. So I had to go back under the knife to get the screws fixed. So I think in total, I had seven surgeries on my leg spanning, uh, well, from being, the accident to when I was finally healed and done with everything was the full two years. I, yeah, I know it was a long time and I was trying yeah. to figure out where I saw you because I know I wouldn't have seen you at the 2019 event. And in 2020 it was canceled, but there was a fall so in 2020, event that you were at. Yeah. Uh, in the 2020, that would have been the fall event. And that was, that would have been in between a couple of my surgeries. Yeah. Because I remember I was rolling around on that scooter. I, I took my totters electric <laughs> razor and because I knew I was gonna do a lot of walking that day. And at that point, you know, I was, I still wasn't healing properly. So I'd have a lot of swelling if I was on my leg for a lot of times and, you know, there's still a lot of pain associated with my leg. So I just mobbed it around on that scooter all day and, 
we kept the walking to a minimum. So yeah, I think after that, um, that would have been what November, I think, when you guys were out. Yeah, and, and for uh, the life of me, a, I can't remember what that event was. It was somebody's... it was it was Bike Week. It was a Bike Week filler because they weren't going to be able to do it in uh, they weren't able to do it early twenty because of COVID, and so they made a smaller event in uh, November. Was it November? No, October, November, one of the two. Yeah, it was somewhere so, in there, and I can't remember what it was yeah. called. It was like. I want to yeah. say it was like I think still, Joe's Bike Week or something like that. Yeah, they, yeah. Because before we had done Bob's Biker Blast, which that's is you what know, it was. Bob Parson. Yeah, that's was what it was. Was it for was. that or Bob's I, Biker Blast? Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so that was that was kind of. I still had what two more surgeries after that time, and that was one of the ones where like a screw back out, go to surgery. Oh, guess what? Another screw back out. So it was one of those things where like, man, like are you guys sure you know what you're doing? Don't you have Loctite at your counter? You bring it to the next surgery and say, hey, <laughs> try this. <laughs> yeah, so my uh, my uh, punch card is definitely full, so my next surgery is free. Let's hope you don't have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'm – honestly, I think I'm good now. I'm, uh, you know, pretty much back to normal. I don't have any issue with now. I'm like, you know, the only reason you can tell I had something there is just because of all the, the stitch marks on my leg, and I had to have a skin graft on uh, – on the outside of my leg, just because I had so many surgeries that I, apparently I didn't have enough skin to sew up properly. So they had to do a skin graft just to be able to sew me back up. So as far as that's concerned, that's the only way you can tell now, but I'm, you know, back in the gym and living my life and like normal, like it never even happened. I don't have any swelling. So, you know, it all worked out in the end. It was just a long road to get there. Yeah, that's good. So you're walking all limp. Everything's gone. Good to go. Everything is gone. No more cane. I mean, it's all, you know, it's all back to normal, which is nice. And, you know, sometimes I can tell when the weather's about to change, but, you know, other than that, it's uh, I'm good to go. Cool. Good to go, and now a brand new title. Is that the, is it still the largest Harley-Davidson dealer in the world? As by square footage, we are the largest. We have a 150,000 square foot building, so we got quite the footprint. But yeah, we are the largest, and it's funny watching customers come in for the first time because you know it's their first time because their jaw's open as they're looking around and, and seeing what's going on. You know, there's not too many dealerships where you walk in and there's a barbershop to your right. And above the barbershop on the second floor is a tattoo parlor. Um, and you want to step out of the tattoo parlor, you can go to the, our chapel and get married if you'd like. And uh, and then we have a 50-seat 50, uh, 50 theater in the in the basement, uh, which gets used a lot for our workshops. And, uh, you know, when people want to have events here, they, they'll rent out that space. So, um, you know, it's, it's, quite the, it's, it's quite the spectacle when you walk in. There's a lot to look at. And it's... Uh, you know, it's definitely an adult candy store for sure. Definitely impressive. And that's what you kind of gave us a little tour. I was going to say, give us a little bit of a, a tour as you, but you kind of did that as you walk in and you said the tattoo shop, right? Is that upstairs? I was thinking it was right yeah, inside so, the door. No, so right inside the door as you come in, it's just that we, what used to be like our leather and lace room. So we kind of, they kind of sold some lingerie kind of stuff, biker style. That never really went very well. So they decided to put a barbershop in there, which I think is a great idea. And then uh, upstairs is the tattoo shop. And, you know, everything is uh, a lot of glass walls. So you kind of kind of see everything. Uh, even our service department, if you walk towards our service department, it's uh, basically a large fishbowl. And it's all glass windows outside and even inside behind the service rider. So there's no, uh, there's no behind the scenes per se here. Like you're, you're able to see everything as it goes. And that's part of the allure. And it's nice that customers get to see their bikes up on a lift and, and what's happening. And, and so it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's definitely different than a lot of times what you see when you walk into these dealerships. And, you know, it's definitely part of the appeal. And, you know, being in Arizona, we're definitely a tourist spot. And, and uh, this is definitely a place that people like to come and check out. For sure. I can see why. Because, I mean, it, it's impressive. And I can, I can see that everybody would love to come in and go, yeah, okay, my bike really is on the, up on the lift. They're not just telling me that it is. They are actually working on it. Yeah, absolutely. The front of that place... It's, it's Hayden Road, right? I'll let you tell us where it is. But the front of it, where we set up in the back, I was almost in as much awe as walking out the front doors as I was walking into the building itself. The front of that thing is amazing. It's huge. Right on the, the roundabout. Yeah, they did, a, they did a great job when they were designing the place. You look at it when you're coming down the street before you get to the roundabout, and it's just this, this just larger-than-life building and these... Uh, these nice awnings that go between the poles that we park our bikes on. It's a very large patio. So we have all that space to park our motorcycles on. Uh, we usually keep that for our pre-owned out there. And then as you know, as you're able to turn through the roundabout and turn onto the road that's uh, 
our actual road for our driveway to come in the parking lot. The front of the building is just as gorgeous. We have this really nice large patio. You know, we have a stage a stage outside for our bands when we host bands on weekends. And so it's, you know, upstairs and a downstairs patio. We've got a large kitchen here so we can, you know, serve food out of or, you know, drinks if we're having our parties. Um, so it's, it's really set up to be a fun uh, place to go to and, and just a, an entertaining environment. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Like I, like you said, it's, it's the dealership that I think most dealerships want to strive for. And, and we've been in, you look at some of the Harley articles that come out to just dealership and there's pictures of our dealership in there and, and our walls, how they're set up in the parts department and, and different things. So it's cool to see, like it's recognized as, you know, uh, a big deal. And it really is a big deal. It is. What's the story with the gong? Tell us about that. I don't yeah, know how many so, people listening uh, will know where that came from. Right. Well, a lot of, you know, a lot of dealerships, when a customer buys a, a motorcycle, they like to celebrate that. And a lot of, I've seen a lot of them have a bell they ring and, you know, or they announce the customer, whatever it may be. But our owner decided to take it a, a, another notch and he actually got a gong. And that gong was owned by the Blue Oyster Cult and actually used on stage uh, back in the 70s. And I don't know how he found it, but he found it and he owns it. And now it sits in the middle of our dealership. So when uh, when a customer buys a motorcycle from us, we, you know, we light up the ceremony that, that lets everybody know that they just bought a bike. You know, all our employees come out and they're clapping and listening to the uh, listening to the uh, reel of what's, you know, count down to the gong hit. And, and then at the end of three, they hit the gong. And I think Phil's got quite the crack to it. And yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. It's uh, people enjoy it. You know, we've had people cry at the gong, you know, their first motorcycle and we're celebrating that and yeah it's it's cool it's fun to watch people's reactions and they, and they love hitting the gong you know some hit it softly and some try to send it through the door but uh regardless it's, it's just a fun experience it is it's really cool and it's very prominently displayed right there as you walk in right in the middle of everything there's no missing it that's for sure so we're recording this and uh this will come out on the 14th I believe, no, the 26th of March was my plan because I wanted to come out. Yeah, maybe we'll do this on the 14th. I wanted it to come out in time to talk to people about Arizona Bike Week and what you guys do there, how your layout is. It's been a couple of years now, but we talked about, you and I were talking about possibly changing up the layout a little bit to include that road, but I don't know. I figured you could kind of give us a layout of what's going to be going on during Arizona Bike Week at your location. Sure. Yeah, so we... um... You know, we always at Westworld, we always um, would have a couple of vendors that we'd work in hand in hand with. And, and this year we're just keeping it to Vance and Hines. So the Vance and Hines are going to have uh, their truck out there. And, um, you know, we supply the product and they supply the techs and they're able to put the put all the exhaust and air cleaner systems that you need right then and there, which is nice. So that's where we're concentrating this year as far as offsite is just going to be Vance and Hines over at uh, Westworld. And then, of course, we'll have the Harley Davidson demo trucks out there. Uh, Harley's actually bring out two demo trucks this year, so they'll have every every model available out there to ride and and, and take for a spin. So that's always fun to have them out here. And actually, we just had them here last weekend too, and it was a great turnout. People have to see a lot of the new colors and paint jobs and and ride all the things that that we don't necessarily always have on our floor because we're selling them so quickly. So that was good for them. But as far as on site goes, you know, we've always kind of uh, try to make it bigger every year and, and do more and. And that's no different this year. You know, we're going to have, uh, you know, bands every day, a uh, couple probably, actually probably a couple bands every day. And, uh, you know, food and beer on site. We'll have food trucks. And then, of course, all the vendors, uh, you being one of them. And then, of course, you mentioned earlier Brian Cloth. We'll have Clockworks out here. Um, we're going to have Rockford Fosgate. They'll be um, they'll be here, um, you know, with all their different, uh, different stage kits that you can put on your bike. And then, of course, now Harley Davidson has... Uh, has got gotten with them and built a system for their bikes with Rocker Fosgate. So they'll have that too. Um, we'll do, uh, for those who aren't familiar with Shy- Cycle Shade, Cycle Shade will be out here. They're the ones that have that real nice, just uh, not a full bike cover, but it covers the parts that get hot. So it's, you know, tour pack to handlebars. So it covers your seat area. So it's pretty cool. It's a nice little handy cover you can keep with you. And especially in uh, coming out to Arizona and having those black seats, it's nice to have something like that. And then we have our uh, bug slide. Lori comes out, and she's uh, bug slide's a great product for uh, detailing and uh, keeping that bike looking like the way it should. And you know, with everybody coming in from out of town, 
usually their bikes look like they could use a good washing by the time they get to us. So it's always nice to have her here. Uh, this year we're bringing Legend Suspension on. Uh, this will be the first time uh, working with them, but we have a good relationship with them. We sell a lot of Legend Suspension. It's a great suspension. So it'll be nice to have them on site and have a professional here talking about that. And then we'll have uh, Tab Performance Mufflers will be here. And of course, they'll be talking about their mufflers and we'll be able to, you know, have install specials for that stuff. Um, and then we will have uh, some smaller vendors and motor clothes. They'll be inside, you know, Wolverine boots will be here, you know, Wiley X classes. Um, and then uh, it's, the list goes on. It's almost hard to try to figure out everybody we're going to have here, but uh, uh, Saddleman Seats will be here. Uh, Saddleman Seats is a great seat. We sell a lot of their products. Um, they've got some really cool uh, seats for baggers as well as soft tails. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a big undertaking, but we love it because we just love to have everything here and everything available to our customers because you don't always get to talk to a professional beyond the parts professional you're dealing with, the guy that's actually in charge of their specific product. So there's a lot of knowledge to be had there, and so we always enjoy that. That's cool because it's, it's good for us too as vendors because we get to find out what questions we're not answering through you know normal advertising or marketing channels, social media, whatever. So if, if they have questions, they can come and ask any of us or like in the case of exhaust or those people, they're actually putting it on. They designed it. They built it for your bike. They actually are the ones putting it on for you. That's always cool as a customer to see that actually take place on your own motorcycle. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we pretty much try to make it so that you are going to, you can get front to back service here. Uh, I forgot to mention with customer dynamics will be out here. So, you know, literally everything that you can do to your bike from, you know, from the front wheel to the back wheel, you know, we will have somebody on site to make those changes for you. And, you know, usually on those longer rides, when you're heading somewhere, you're picking those things apart on your motorcycle. Like, well, if things were just like this, or if I see was a little more comfortable, if my suspension was a little better, you know, man, it was at night, I wish I could see a little better. So all these things, you know, obviously, as you learn when you're rolling down the road and, and, and making mental notes on what you can change, we'll have it all here. And that's that's the cool part, too, because it's a, just a one-stop shop and everybody can come in, get what they want, and leave with it. That's at your store. What is actually out at Westworld? I have not been out there for whatever reason. I, we just always we show up, we work, and by then it's late, we're tired, we go get supper, and we call it a day. Sure. I have not been at Westworld. And well, at Westworld, they've changed things up a little bit this year, too. It used to be about $25 or so to get in. Um, and, and then that would include the concert ticket. Cause you know, they have, they'll have uh, some name bands out there too for in the evenings, but this year they decided to change it up a little bit. They're going to do the concert venue different and they're just going to charge a, a small fee for all five days of, uh, to get into the vendor site. So they're paying, you're just paying 12 bucks for five days this year, which will be nice. That'll, that'll definitely help the vendors because you know, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily want to spend the $25 to go look at, product and you know now they don't have to it's you know it's you know a couple dollars per day essentially with that wristband so that's i'm I'm excited about that that'll do really well for the vendors out there but essentially that's what it is it's just a a bunch of vendors in in one spot Uh, so for all these things that you've thought about you're going to see there and it's a lot of uh smaller vendors too so you know walking into a harley dealership and looking through the the main catalog like drag specialty sakuraki you know, of course, Harley Davidson catalog. It's a lot of that stuff that you wouldn't see necessarily. And like I said, some of these smaller shops that will be out there, clothing, lighting, you know, things you can hang on your bike. And then of course the bigger vendors uh, like Vance and Heinz actually do exhaust and stuff on, you know, they're going to be out there. So that's, that's essentially what it is. And uh, if there's any rides that are happening, a lot of times it'll be leaving there or coming back to there. Um, so it'll be centralized in that point. They do camping out there. So you can bring your, you know, for those who are trailing their bikes in for the week, they can set up their campers out there. They have some RV spots. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's like the own little world out there. And, and we've had definitely had fun in the past years when we've, uh, when we've been out there. You know, we'll usually, you know, party with a lot of the customers in the evenings and, and hang out and, you know, just talk motorcycle and just have fun. It's part of, you know, that rally, rally life. Yeah, that, that sounds like fun. Maybe, uh, maybe with any luck this year, I'll make it over there. Like I said, I just Yeah, it, it, it's, just it's definitely something to check out for sure. Yeah, and this year, like I say, we're driving out. Uh, we're we're going from you farther west, so we're going to drive out ourselves. And uh, our our footprint on your lot has gotten quite a bit bigger this year. I've been chatting with Dean, and I think we got that all sorted out. Dean's your new parts manager, right? Yeah, Dean took over for me um, when I moved into the general sales manager role. 
Um, and, you know, he's done a great job and, you know, kind of like wh- how it was for me when I stepped in and had my first bike week, he's at that same point. It's kind of funny to see. And I, I remind him, I go, Hey man, I was, I had the same exact expression on my face and I was worried about all the same things. I go, but once we get into it, it's just fun and it just goes. And, you know, we spent a lot of time preparing for it. And that's like why it's so great to when we get to actually do it and then, and then, you know, more so be done with it because it is such a big undertaking. I mean, we started talking about this back in November, you know, we started laying the, the foundation for this, these things in November. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes to make a five day rally happen and try to make it as, as, as successful as possible. Yeah. And in talking to him, he's, it's funny you mentioned that. Cause I think I, on, on, you know, the look on his face and how it's a little overwhelming because I think what I told him is no matter how bad we screw this up, nobody's going to notice. We're still going to have fun. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And we're the only ones usually that are going to know if we screwed something up. It doesn't usually get out to the, to the public. So, you know, we're all, our, own worst, our own worst critics in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. I'm trying to think if I missed anything talking about, you know, bike week. We talked at one point about having the city shut down that road. Is that going to happen? Yeah, it doesn't look like it. Um, we had talked about it, but because it's during the week and there's other businesses on that road, it would kind of make it hard. And there's a lot of traffic that goes in there because there are a lot of surrounding businesses from us. So we just weren't able to make that happen. Okay. You know, obviously we try to keep our parking lot as, as available as possible to cars or motorcycles to park. And as you add vendors to that, uh, that shrinks that footprint of available parking spots. So that's kind of, that was the thought behind maybe having it on the, the roads and stuff. But I think for, uh, I think for ease of use and not having to worry about having people cross through traffic and stuff, it's, it was just going to be easier to, to do it how we've done it in the past. And people are used to it now. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, yeah, absolutely. Um, on that road I'm talking about, and we're talking about the same road I know, but for the listeners, it's kind of like an S shaped road. Is there, there's not roadside parking. That's the issue, right? That's the issue. Yeah. I mean, it's you in a pinch, we could, we could park some people on the side of the road. But like I said, you get people on both sides of those roads. It, it makes it very narrow through there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's just kind of try to avoid it. No, nope, just curious. I remember we talked about that in years past. Yeah. I know I'm super excited to get back out there. We haven't seen in Arizona Bike Week since, was it 2019, wasn't it? 2019 was the last year. So, it's uh, you know, we definitely missed it as a dealership. We, we always love doing it. Our employees love being part of it. I mean, it's just fun to see all the bikes that come in and, and meet all these new people from all over the place and, you know, and, and uh, really help them customize or, you know, answer any questions or just make their, their trip that much more fun. And, you know, having the dealership that we have it definitely, definitely helps that along. So we've, we've missed it for sure. And we're excited to have it again. It's going to be the 25th anniversary, uh, which is going to be huge. Um, you know, one, people haven't been able to get out and do much, and on top of that, it's the 25th anniversary, so we're definitely expecting a lot of people. I, I'm hoping so. I think we all are. Yeah, right. <laughs> For sure. So that leads me to this portion of the show that I like to ask. I have five questions, and I understand you have not listened to an episode. So what I like about that is these five questions for you are completely new, which means we get real unthought of <laughs> answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you can okay. fumble through these because these are these are fun for me. I guess I, all right. I have to assume they're fun for everybody when you start listening to all the different answers. So the first <laughs> sure. question is: Tell us something that you believe that other people think is insane. Something I believe that other people think is insane. Yes. Wow. Man, that's a tough one. I mean, go deep on these things, man. <laughs> um, wow. Maybe I should have listened to the other podcast and had time to think about it. <laughs> um, God, man, I don't even know if I have an answer for that because, you know, the things I see day in and day out and, and deal with necessarily aren't necessarily like the craziest of things. Um, you know, I think that maybe if they knew, as far as the dealership standpoint goes, how many how many people we put through this dealership and how many um, bikes we sell and uh, customers we take care of, they may think that's an insane number because there's a lot of dealerships in this in this valley and and you know we one thing we strive for is being honest and upfront and letting everybody know how we're about family and and that you're part of that when you're in this dealership and I think uh, you don't see that everywhere and so 
people probably sometimes don't believe you. That's what you're actually actually do. But that comes from the top down, and we're all about it. I kind of guess that answers your question in a way, but kind of. I'll accept it. Your, <laughs> <laughs> your belief is that uh, your your dealership treats everybody like family, and people think that's probably not true, or they think that's insane. That's a legit yeah, answer. I, mean, I don't think they get it. I don't think they get it enough out there in the world to to believe that there's you know there's that honesty behind it. You don't see enough of it. I think that's the problem. Is it's hard for right. people to believe it when. You know, they're told this at their local, you know, Ford dealership or their local Honda motorcycle dealer or whatever. I mean, and I'm not picking on anybody, in, you know, specifically, but they don't see it all the time, but they hear it in the For advertising, sure. right? Right, right. And that's something that's really cool about this industry as a whole is we're really one giant family and we want everybody involved. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, and it's all about two wheels, really, when you come down to it. Like, you know, you got Harleys, you got Indians, you got all these models out there. But, you know, it, essentially just being a, a motorcyclist and, and just knowing that you're on the road and we deal with all the same stuff, and it's, it's, a, it's a family and it's a, it's a big club. It is. And we sure have a lot of fun doing it. Okay, so absolutely. the next question. This can be an investment of money, time, energy, or any other resources. But what is the best or most worthwhile investment you have made when it comes to your world with two wheels? Uh, you know what? I think it was moving to Arizona and picking the dealership that I worked for. Because I'll tell you what, like I've been doing this for, like I said, 21 years. And it's funny because this actually came up in conversation the other day um, when I was telling some people that I, I bought my new position. And, you know, the decisions I've made in life and the places that it's taken me have led me to this dealership and you know i chose to to jump ship from desert wind which i had i loved working there it was it was great um i the owner uh, ray krogan at the time he was uh, great to work for and but i saw the potential of working the world's largest and i always had my mindset of uh you know one day becoming a gm um i never knew that from a parts manager position that that was ever going to happen for me but you know they were here saw something in me and and knew that i wasn't just a parts manager per se, you know, is much more than that. I've always involved myself with all the dealership uh, aspect rather than just in my, you know, in my line of sight. And uh, for just uh, all around investment in myself, I made the decision to come here and I've worked hard and, you know, made my way up the ranks. And, you know, now I'm, I'm leading this, this beast of a machine, this world's largest dealership. And, and that's really, I think my biggest thing would be that. Yeah, let me congratulate you again. That is awesome. How I I don't normally go this way, but how would you advise some kid that's just getting started in the parts department somewhere at some small shop to how would you how would you explain to them or tell them, "Hey, keep your eyes, you know, keep focused, keep your eyes on the prize because you can get there." How do you like yeah. you obviously believe that yeah. from a small town Harley sure. Davidson dealership and now like you For said sure. you're steering the world's largest ship for Harley Davidson. Well, it's one of those things where you got to stay out of your comfort zone. And, and even our, our owner, Bob Parsons, that's one of his 16 keys, keys to success is, you know, stay out of your comfort zone. And that goes a long ways because if, if you just get stuck in that rut where you like with what you're comfortable with, you don't really end up achieving more unless you happen to luck into it. But, you know, I always kind of always put myself out there to learn more. Uh, be involved with as much as I could be involved with and, and not just in my little house of a parts department, right? And I guess that was coming back from even being just a counter guy. Um, you know, I, I kind of involved myself with what what the service process was, you know, what most motor clothes were doing. And, you know, and I and the, from the people that were above me, I, I took lessons from them and what they were doing in their day-to-day and, um, you know, asking the right questions and, and knowing and being smart enough to know what I don't know you know, and then finding those answers out. And that's what it's all about. It really just showing initiative and getting out there and doing it. Um, because you can start as a bike washer and make up your way through the ranks. If you just do the work to better yourself. Yeah, that's great advice. So hopefully we get somebody listening that shares that with somebody. I, I, I wrote down, it was about 47 minutes before editing that um, I have somebody in mind that I'm going to just send that little sound clip to. So that was great. Nice. The next question, what is, and this is one that you probably 
you'll be able to answer this one. What is the worst advice you see or hear being dispensed in this world, you know, motorcycle world? Maybe uh, stay in your lane. You know, don't worry about it. That's not, not for you to worry about. Because if you get told that and you get that stuff in your mind, where does that leave you? That leaves you of like, okay, I'm not, you know, I'm not ready to do anything different than I'm doing. You know, and that it, I've seen that in the past through different areas, you know, where somebody's not willing to help somebody and it's like kind of figure it out kind of thing. You know, I think if you tell somebody to uh, just worry about what they need to worry about, that just doesn't go any, that doesn't take anybody anywhere. And that's not the greatest of life. I've always been one to, to, and that's probably why I found my way up into a, a, the leadership role I'm in now is I've always been willing to share whatever knowledge I have with somebody or, or try to make them better because at the end of the day, you're only as good as the people that you surround yourself with in this industry, you know, because uh, you need to build build them up so they can build you up in a sense by doing the best for you. So I, I think if you're not willing to help and you're not willing to uh, uh, bring somebody up with you per se or, you know, bring the whole dealership up with you, uh, that's that's pretty crappy of uh, yourself as almost as non-advice, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is not an answer I expected to ever hear. And, <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is, you know, because most people would think, you know, get, you know, you got to get this or you have to get that. But no, that is solid advice. I love it. The rising tide lifts all ships, right? That's it. So that's great. As far as my listeners or this audience Tuner enters to the Wild Ass Podcast. Do you have any asks or requests of any of us? You know, um, well, one, keep listening. I love the way, I love your format. That's for sure. It's, uh, this has been fun for me. Uh, this is my first, first podcast I've ever done. But, uh, you know, I ask for anybody that is in the area, you guys come check out Bike Week. Um, you won't be disappointed. It's a lot of fun. Um, keep putting those miles on that bike and uh, and just enjoying your life behind the, behind the handlebars because, I'll tell you what, that's just uh, one of the greatest things ever. And I, I, I miss it. I haven't been on a bike since my accident. I'm mostly just because of my kids. They're, you know, they're young, uh, two young ladies. And uh, they were really devastated when they saw me in the hospital. So I'm going to wait to get myself a bike when uh, when they're, you know, out of the house and, and moved on as that goes. And But, uh, you know, I miss being behind the, behind the steering wheel. It's the best therapy ever. You know, a good way to clear your head on the way home or in your way to work and to start that day. And so... You know, there's a lot of lot of listeners, probably majority of your listeners that are, you know, riding two wheels and just keep doing your thing, man, and enjoy it. Like that's, you know, it's a big part of life. It's been a big part of my life and it's gotten to me where, where I am now. Yeah, for sure. And it will be a part again. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm, we'll never give it up. No. <laughs> little hiatuses yeah. here and there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sometimes we have to take those. What, no. uh, do, are you on social media? Do you take part in any of that stuff? Is there any place we can follow you? See no, I, I stepped, I stepped back from all that. You know, I was, uh, I just got kind of tired of it, you know, as I'm sure some people do. Um, I, you know, slowly broke the chains and, you know, had that, had a desire to keep looking a few days after I, I deleted my accounts, but you know, as the time passed, that's made it a lot easier. So, you know, I, uh, I rely on other people to keep an eye on uh, my social media as far as the work, as far as work goes. But, you know, I'd love for your listeners to follow Harley Davis and Scottsdale. We've got a, a great marketing team and, and uh, we put a lot of good content out there on uh, on uh, one YouTube as well as uh, Instagram and Facebook. So you're not going to follow me because you can't because I'm uh, off the grid in that sense. But I'd love for you to follow the dealership for sure. Yeah, and I'll take I'll put the notes of uh, in the show notes. I'll put um, the YouTube link, Instagram, and Facebook. I'll make sure that once this thing publishes, I share it on your guys's page. So whoever whoever manages yeah. that page will probably have to approve the post. But uh, we'll get sure. that shared out there for sure. So hopefully your listeners can get to get to know you a little bit more before they even come and see you. Absolutely. That'd be great. It's awesome. Well, I am looking forward to getting out there to see you. Um, I, I really appreciate your time. I'm surprised we've made it almost an hour and we've had no interruptions, either one of us, because for those people listening, Joe has literally told the team, I'm going to punch out for just a little bit here and record this show. And I have had to do the same thing here. So we got pretty lucky uh, in that way. Yeah, I got a, had a couple of heads poke in and poke right back out. Oh, whoops, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Well, I, I again, I really appreciate it. So much more respect for you now, especially after these last five questions. That's that's great. Personal development is something we work on really hard here at 
wild ass. And uh, it's nice to know that we are not the only ones doing that. So I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, yeah, thank so, you. So, yeah, thank you for thank you very much for coming on the show with me. Yeah, I had fun. I appreciate it. Uh, it, was, it was good. You know, well, we don't usually don't get to just sit back and talk, and it's definitely what this just felt like. And uh, we don't have to be uh, all business for the majority of the stuff like you are when you're here. But, uh, yeah, it was good times. On that note, when I come out there, make sure you bring that scooter because you owe me a race because I'm bringing mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually might be able to do a foot race with you now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. So, anyway, little running joke going back to when you had the scooter there. So, yeah. that's all That's all we got. Folks, if you like what you're listening to, you like hearing this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. You can follow all of the adventures on Facebook or Instagram by looking for The Real Wild Ass. I am Wild Ass Craig on Instagram as well. You can also find all of the Wild Ass Podcast episodes right on the homepage of our website, wild-ass.com. Joe. Thank you again, and thank you all for listening.